Welcome to our fourth edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. Uh, we're going to be shaking and baking today. I mean, we've got some really important issues, not just in terms of what's coming up for the next week, but what has happened in the previous week. And in the previous week, we had a dismissal by an Obama-appointed judge by the name of Amy Berman Jackson of the case that we brought on behalf of the parents of Ty Woods and Sean Smith, two of the victims at Benghazi, on behalf of their parents, Charles Woods and Pat Smith. And this judge made a political decision. It's up on appeal right now. It will be reversed, but it tells you about what we're dealing with in the judiciary. And we're also going to be talking about the case of Cliven Bundy, who successfully stood off the Bureau of Land Management and Harry Reid's goons. He had put his own person in charge of the Bureau of Land Management as part of a land grab, not just against the Bundy family who had ranched their land in Nevada at Bunkerville for over 150 years, but other ranchers who have lost their ranches thanks to the heavy hand of the federal government. And when Cliven complained and wouldn't roll over, the goons were sent in by Obama, Harry Reid, and their cohorts. And they beat, excuse the French, the crap out of the Bundy family. They killed their cattle. They buried them in mass graves. Cliven didn't hurt anybody, neither, neither did his family or his supporters, the protesters who came. They simply protested. They were bearing arms. They're entitled to do that under the Second Amendment of the Constitution. And for that, Cliven Bundy and 18 others, others are being prosecuted by a judge, you guessed it, handpicked, recommended to Obama by Harry Reid himself, Judge, judge Gloria Navarro. We're going to be talking about that with the head of Gun Owners of America, Larry Pratt. And we're going to be talking about some other things as well. We're going to be talking about what happened with Kathy Griffin this week, where she held up a bloody head of President Trump and now is being disingenuously, unsincerely, as I might say, insincerely criticized by even CNN and others who basically had to run away from her. But let's talk about what's going to be happening next week, because that's super important. The Senate Intelligence Committee, which is run by this establishment character by the name of Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina, someone who's two-faced, who, frankly, is trying to undercut President Trump. He's part of the Republican establishment, along with Senator John McCain, who literally hates Trump and is doing whatever he can to destroy him, and others, is conducting this hearing. Now, what are they focusing on? They're not focusing on illegal mass surveillance of President Trump and the people around him, or for that matter, the entire American people. I went to see the staff of Senator Burr weeks ago, and I told him about our whistleblower, Dennis Montgomery, who left the NSA and CIA as a contractor with 47 hard drives, over 600 million pages of information, showing mass surveillance on the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, other justices, 156 judges, President Trump, his family, Trump Tower, and yours truly. Anybody who was anybody was surveyed, in addition to hundreds of millions of Americans. And we now through, know through Circa News that this was being done as well by the FBI under James Comey. Well, not coincidentally, I brought Montgomery under immunity, grant of immunity to James Comey. He produced all of that information. It's been buried for two and a half years. I informed Senator Burr's staff of this. This is a big issue. There's this huge Orwellian state, this police state, which is overlooking the American people like a sword of Damocles, where we can't communicate with each other without fear that we're being exposed. And we see what happened to President Trump. Everything he says or does winds up in the media. And nobody can even refute what's being said because the sources are anonymous. So now, next week, we have Comey come in front of that committee to try to assassinate the president, to try to get him indicted by special counsel Robert Mueller, who was appointed, I think, it wasn't a really smart move to put him in there because he's a friend of Comey and he's been compromised in the past. You might remember he was FBI director when 9-11 happened. Biggest intelligence failure in American history. He's someone who covered up investigations of my FBI special agent clients, Robert Wright and, and John Vinson, who were looking at Saudi money laundering because to get too close to the Saudis at that time was to get too close to the Bush family, who were very close with the royal family. And, of course, W. Bush was the president at the time. This guy is not... An honest individual, Mueller, contrary to what you're hearing in the, in the media, the ill-informed media. But anyway, Comey's coming in front of that Senate committee, and he's going to be testifying about what he allegedly wrote in memos, claiming that President Trump told him to drop the investigation of Michael Flynn and to drop the investigation of the so-called Russian 
collaboration, or connection. Well, no one's been asking the questions as to whether Comey created those memos after the fact. I believe he probably did. Comey has, has it in for President Trump. He wants revenge. So, therefore, the first witness that's going to come up at 10 a.m. next Thursday is Comey. And you've got to ask yourself a question. Why is it that the Republican chairman of the Senate Intel Committee wants to stick, stick it up the derriere, so to speak, of President Trump, but he's not interested in this mass surveillance that has been perpetrated by James Comey and others in the intelligence agency, such as James Clapper, who was director of national intelligence under Obama, and such as John Brennan, that corrupt individual, reportedly a closet Muslim. It's been reported he has a prayer rug uh, in his office. At least he did when he was CIA director. And this is what Trump is dealing with right now. He's dealing with both his own party, And the opposition party trying to destroy him because they want to have their candidate run, their establishment candidate run for president in 2020. Well, we at Freedom Watch are nonpartisan. You know, I'm critical of the president when I need to be. For instance, he didn't move the embassy uh, in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem this week. I'm going to be doing a YouTube uh, that you can watch on our our website at freedomwatchusa.org, urging him to do that. I'll be critical. But... To destroy this presidency is to destroy our last chance. And if you think that Barack Hussein Obama was bad, a closet Muslim who has favored Arab interests for years, who did everything he can to harm Israel, who created racial division in this country to the point that cops were being killed almost at a rate at one a day, if you think he's bad, why do you wait to see what we could get after a President Trump uh, impeachment uh, and conviction? And, of course, I'm going to do our best to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, But I'll tell you something. This country is in deep trouble. It's out of control. Uh, They're trying to destroy the left, Fox News, the last bastion, at least on cable, uh, with the exception of Newsmax, which does a great job as well, of any conservative thought. Uh, This is the problem that we face. Now, let's look at the House Intelligence Committee, because they're also questionable. Now, it's just been reported that Chairman Nunes, and I also lobbied his staff, a guy by the name of Alan D'Souza, who was his lawyer, to also bring Dennis Montgomery in front of the committee to see, in fact, what had been happening to the American people in this mass surveillance. Well, Nunes issued some subpoenas to the National Security Agency and also the Central Intelligence Agency with regard to just a very limited snapshot of the unmasking of names with regard to President Trump's both campaign staff and then administration after he was sworn in as president on the 20th of January. Well, why isn't Nunes bringing Dennis Montgomery in front of the committee? Why is he not interested in that? Is it because the intelligence committees have known that the intelligence agencies have been conducting illegal mass surveillance, as Judge Richard Leon found in two lawsuits I brought uh, before his court? Or is it because they have dirt on these congressmen and senators that can fly out of their files? I call it the Anthony Weiner factor. I'm not saying that they've done what Anthony Weiner has done, but I think they may be a little bit afraid that their Weiners will be exposed if, in fact, they push too hard on these agencies. And this is the situation we face today, because, frankly, Congress is just a dog and pony show, uh, and they don't have the interests of the American people in mind. They have the interests of their establishment parties in mind. And that's why Freedom Watch does what it does. And that's why we fight for you. And that's why we bring hard-hitting cases. Even my former group, Judicial Watch, by and large, does not bring hard-hitting cases. They bring Freedom of Information Act cases. Well, yeah, you can get documents and you can expose them and go on, on television or on radio. But what happens then? We bring lawsuits like the Benghazi lawsuit. We bring lawsuits like the NSA lawsuit. We fight as best we can, and I call it like it is. I'm not holding anything back, much like President Trump didn't hold anything back. But when you talk, when you tell the truth, when you push too hard, these establishment interests will try to destroy you. Well, you know what? Our founding fathers pledged their fortunes, pledged their honor, and risked their lives to found a new nation in my native city of Philadelphia. We, the American people, have to do the same thing. We cannot just sit by and watch what's going on as this last hope of a presidency gets destroyed. So listen to the show every week. Go to our website at freedomwatchusa.org, 
freedomwatchusa.org. We need your your donations. We need your contributions. We need you to participate. We need to ramp up. We need to hire more people because we are your Justice Department as our current Justice Department run by someone who I think is a great Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, is himself under siege on a minute-by-minute basis. He needs our support, too. That's my alma mater, the Justice Department. I believe in it. I want it to do its job. But the left and the Republican establishment is doing its best to bring it to a halt. So now we have Congress, which has come to a halt. They're trying to bring the executive branch to a halt. And our judges, as you're going to hear later today, most of them are so compromised, 70 to 80 percent Clinton and Obama appointees. Frankly, most of them are political hacks. I hate to say that. I'm a lawyer. I don't want the system to be like that. So also look to our website at freedomwatchusa.org. See our judicial selection strikeforce.org, the coalition, where we're recommending independent judges to the president of the United States for appointment. There are over over 100 vacancies. But frankly, all three branches of government have broken down. And you're going to see that today in the rest of this show. So I want to thank you for listening. And we're going to be back shortly with a very dynamic and hard-hitting exposition of the difficulty that we face in this country. Thank you. Fearless. This claimant is crazy, he's racist, he's out to kill the Democrats. Dangerous. He don't care, he uses the court and the law. Lethal. This is bad. Special prosecutor. Very bad. Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. We're back with Larry Pratt, a friend of mine who happens to be the person who runs Gun Owners of America. I mean, he established that group. It's a great group. It's to protect Second Amendment rights. That is the right to bear arms. And what could be more important than a case that I've been involved in concerning the Bundy family? Cliven Bundy, his sons. I represent Cliven in different capacities. That case has been headed towards trial now for a year and a half. A judge who was recommended to President Obama for appointment by the name of Gloria Navarro, uh, a hand-picked, frankly, uh, compromised judge of Harry Reid, that corrupt senator from Nevada, that senator who had mafia connections and created so much difficulty in the Senate, made her chief judge. And she's been presiding over it. And just yesterday, she sentenced a defendant who was tried, the the trial's been broken up. Cliven's going to be coming up to be tried in a few months. She sentenced this defendant who did nothing, didn't hurt anybody, simply was armed, as you're entitled to be. He was just protesting what had happened to the Bundy family because the Bureau of Land Management, at Harry Reid's direction, he put his hand-picked person in there, busted into their ranch, frankly like goons, threatened them with death, beat up Cliven's sister, Margaret, threw her to the ground, tased his two sons, kicked his dog violently, the Bureau of Land Management agents, and killed some of the cattle and buried them in a secret grave. When people saw that around the country, they came to Cliven's aid, and they came onto the ranch. They thought they could be hurt themselves, so they were armed, and they were simply peacefully protesting. Nobody got hurt. The only people that got hurt were the Bundys. So this tells you something about why the framers in our Constitution— have a right to bear arms for us, for the, we the American people. And it's the first time in American history in a major way that the government has been stood down, for lack of a better word, from its heavy-handedness. And ask yourself the question, the BLM claimed that Cliven owed money for grazing fees. He claims he doesn't. So I wanted Larry to come on to explain to us why the Second Amendment is so important and, and why this case is so important. And I know he feels the same way. Larry? Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this issue. Uh, This um, Bundy case, it seems to me, uh, involves a violation of not just the Second Amendment, where they were uh, outraged that American citizens might have guns, which they have every right to have. Even if we didn't have a Second Amendment, I would add, we have a right to protect ourselves. Uh, But we do have a Second Amendment, and it's clearly aimed at the federal government. It's aimed at keeping it from going over the top and entering into the zone of tyranny. And the people retain the right to own their own arms in order to have some kind of bulwark against federal overreach. 
Well, in the case of the Bundys, overreach uh, certainly is one way to describe what the feds were doing. Uh, This was something that could have and should have been resolved in court. Uh, Actually, let's back up a step. There should be no Bureau of Land Management. This is something that's not in the enumerated powers given the federal government by our Constitution. It's something that initially was promised the states coming into the Union after the initial 13 that they would come in on the same basis as the states uh, in the East, the the first 13. Well, along the way, um, white men speak with forked tongue, and uh, they didn't keep their word, and they started requiring all kinds of different uh, terms for the western states, west of the Mississippi pretty much, uh, before they would be allowed to come into the Union. And one of them was the retention by the feds of lands that were supposed to have been turned over to the state at the moment of statehood. And so this whole problem that flared up at the Bundy's Ranch roots back almost 100 years to when the federal government was not keeping its word. And that well, and I want to interrupt you here, Larry, because we only have about 30 seconds left, and I'm going to bring you back. Uh, I'm going to bring you back next week, as a matter of fact, if you're free. Great. <laughs> but, but I want to call people to the Clive and Bundy Defense Fund.org website. Good. Clive and Bundy Defense Fund.org. We need contributions for that defense fund. It's a private defense fund. And I want you to see what went on, because we've laid it out. And Larry understands the situation here. There really is no jurisdiction for the federal courts to even look into this matter, much less uh, the use of excessive force against the Bundys and their supporters. So I want to thank you for coming on, Larry. We're going to resume this next week. It's going to be a continuing story. And thank God for people like yourself who are standing up for the American people. Special Prosecutor Larry Klayman. Words that make corrupt politicians make wee-wee in their little pants. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this president. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Special Prosecutor Larry Klayman. To support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. We have on the line right now two really heroic valiant parents, Pat Smith, uh, the parent of Sean Smith, who was reportedly working undercover in Benghazi at the time of that tragedy that occurred there. A tragedy killed her son. And Charles Wood, he's the dad of Ty Woods, uh, a Navy SEAL, Gold Star father. Uh, We decided to represent them at Freedom Watch about a year ago because those deaths could have been avoided. Uh, It's very sad. It's very tragic. But the very fact that then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was using an unsecured private email account, an email server, gave rise to terrorists being able to find out where these two clients' sons were located. In other words, they were killed with Ambassador Chris Stevens. And that gave rise to an action for wrongful death in court. We filed a lawsuit about a year ago, as I said, on that basis. But there was another basis as well. And that was the very reality that Hillary Clinton had called my clients liars. In fact, she told them that this was simply the result, these deaths, of a walk in the woods, in effect, by people who were upset over a a video of the Prophet Muhammad that had been criticized. Well, maybe they had indigestion from eating hummus that wasn't so good. But in fact, it wasn't the result of that. It was the result of an attack by al-Qaeda, and Hillary Clinton knew that. And at the height of her presidential campaign last fall, she called our clients liars, and that's defamation. And we brought a lawsuit for that. At the time, I had the case assigned to a very honorable judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, who had had great success with in a case that we brought against the NSA, where we enjoined these intelligence agencies from surveying us illegally. His name is Richard Leon. But Richard Leon is almost retired. He's now a senior judge. And the case was thrown back into the random pool for reassignment, kind of like a wheel of fortune. The reason it was related 
is because before Richard Land was another matter, which I had brought, a Freedom of Information Act matter, dealing with the reasons why my client's two sons were killed. We wanted documents mm-hmm. from the State Department, so they were related. That was legitimate. But anyway, when the judge threw it back into the random pool, it came out with a different judge named Amy Bur- Berman Jackson. Not coincidentally, an appointment of President Barack Obama and a very leftist judge. Uh, She's a Democrat. And what happened last week was very distressing. And I'm going to let my clients talk about that. But it's it's not over. We've taken an appeal already to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. We're confident this case will be back in court. But Judge Berman, on the eve of the Memorial Day weekend, when my clients are honoring and grieving for their lost sons, gold star parents in effect, both of them, had this, frankly, I think it was outrageous that it was dismissed at this time. And I I took it personally because I believe in my clients. I believe in getting justice for their sons. But to do that right before Memorial Day, even if there was a valid basis, which there wasn't, and I'll tell you real quickly why there wasn't a valid basis, to me was a slap in the face of all servicemen throughout this, this nation and the world who are risking their lives for the American people. This was Memorial Day. It didn't have to be done then. And I got it across my cell phone because you get these electronic notifications from the court at around 5 o'clock last Friday. I was actually eating dinner in Florida. Now, the reason this, this uh, decision is just completely wrong, intentionally so, I believe, is because we maintain that Hillary Clinton was not immune from suit with regard to her use of the private email server, which gave up the coordinates of our client's sons, because it's illegal under State Department regulations and protocol, and in fact, illegal just generally. There's about 17 ways that crimes were committed. Former Attorney General, uh, Deputy Attorney General and Mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, pointed out many times on Fox News in the last years that if you're acting illegally, even if you're a federal official, you lose your immunity. You can be held personally accountable. And this judge granted a motion to dismiss on the wrongful death count, claiming that Hillary Clinton was acting within the scope of her employment as Secretary of State. Now, that's not something that should be taken lightly. And we brought cases in other situations where federal officials have not had immunity. Many years ago, I, I sued uh, the FBI Director Lewis Free. And the Fourth Circuit held he had no immunity for what he did, even though he was FBI director. I won't get into that in any great detail. But at a minimum, before the judge dismissed the case on the basis that Hillary Clinton was acting within the scope of her authority, she should have allowed for discovery. The law provides for that, meaning a deposition. So by dismissing that count, the judge was protecting Hillary Clinton. And we know, of course, recently, just in the last few days, Hillary Clinton has given indications that she's probably going to try to run for president again. And judges who are appointed by presidents like Obama are not just sensitive to Hillary Clinton, but in the back of their mind, they think, maybe if I have a good decision, I might get appointed to a higher court. I'm not saying that's the case here, but it could run through a judge's mind. But the most outrageous aspect of the dismissal was that she dismissed the defamation claim. Hillary Clinton called my clients liars. She wasn't even Secretary of State at the time. She was a private citizen running for the presidency of the United States. She had no immunity. And the issue of who lied could not be taken away from the jury. It had to be decided by the jury. A judge can't do that. We asked for a jury trial. I am convinced that the higher court will overturn this, and when it comes back, we'll, of course, ask for a different judge for an assignment. But I want to ask Charles Woods right now because he was actually administrative law judge. I mean, he knows the way it works. Uh, Charles, what do you think about what happened uh, well, just on the as you know, I was then. an administrative law judge, and uh, if there was an apparent, not even an actual, but if there was even an apparent conflict of interest, I would offer to excuse myself without the parties even asking, and I'd tell them the reason for it. And I think in this case, the judge definitely uh, should have taken the higher ground and uh, offered to dismiss herself just because of the obvious conflict of interest. Yes, and I appreciate that remark. You know, I respect judges. I actually believe in the legal system. That's why I do what I do. But when I see something like this, I get upset. Uh, Pat, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, I'm not a judge. I'm not anything. I'm just a citizen. 
and the citizen that I was at the time, they wouldn't tell me anything. They told me I was not a member of the immediate family. And that that was just before they they lied. They they called me a liar. She went on the show over there for Stephanopoulos and said one of us is lying and it wasn't me. Well, since then she's been making lists of all the people that are against her. She could add my name to that list too. When you're talking about she, you're talking about Hillary Clinton. Absolutely. She has yeah. never once, never once has she or any of her minions ever called me to talk to me. After all these times I've begged and pleaded, but I'm just a citizen. She doesn't need me. Or she didn't need me then and she doesn't need me now. So well, I, she told me how she feels. Well, of course, we know that uh, her excuse for, for what happened was is that People just got get upset over a video. And, Charles, I think you actually recorded a comment that Mrs. Clinton made at the time that she was going to have the videographer who's out here in California prosecuted for what he did. Is that correct? You recorded right. that in your diary. Well, yeah, exactly. I've, I've always carried a diary with me for years, and uh, uh, I write down the memorial uh, basically to memorialize things, uh, significant things that happened during the day. And I just happened to write that down in my book. I had a whole page full of phone numbers and things like that, the family members, because, you know, the events that were, they just happened that week. And this was just a couple of days after Kai was killed in Benghazi. And uh, well, we met with her hmm. uh, uh, when the bodies came into Andrews Air Force Base. And at that time, she talked to me in the presence of other parties, uh, all the family members were around there, and uh, she said uh, that she was going to have the person that was that made the video that was responsible for the death of my son to have him arrested and prosecuted. And I wrote that down. I didn't realize it was that big of a deal at the time, but that's not the function of a secretary of state to decide who's going to be prosecuted. That's the... Uh, you know, the prosecuting attorney, that's their uh, jurisdiction, not her jurisdiction. And that's, well, that, says, was why it was offen- that was why it was offensive to me, and that's why I wrote it down. I had no idea about the lying or what a big impact that this was going to have at a later time. And it should be noted that she also made this uh, statement to other family members as well, who I didn't meet until months later. Well, what's really important here, I think, too, is the fact that the judge herself acknowledged in the opinion, and you can find it at freedomwatchusa.org, that Hillary Clinton said, one of us is lying. Either it's Pat Smith and Charles Woods, or it's me. She obviously wasn't referring to herself as being a liar. She was running for the presidency of the United States. And that very determination has to be made by a jury. A A judge, if you're asking for a jury trial, can't take that away from the jury. And that's why this was not an intellectually honest decision. Now, we respect the judge, and, you know, I've been in front of her before, but this is a highly politicized case. Mrs. Clinton does want to run for the presidency again, even though she said she doesn't want to. It's clear that she does. And I believe that this judge was protecting her. But that's not unusual, unfortunately, today. We have 70 to 80 percent of our judges who were appointed by President Clinton or President Obama. They're very leftist. And at this point... President Trump hasn't won one case, and he's the president of the United States. But I want to spend time here, because I am confident of what ultimately will result, in just talking about your sons, because they were brave, brave, brave heroes. And, you know, that's why I was so taken up with, with your cause. Uh, tell us a little yeah. bit, uh, Pat, about uh, Sean, and then, Charles, tell us about Ty, because we need to remember them, and that's what we wanted to do on Memorial Day. I really didn't want to be dealing with a decision by an Obama-appointed judge, which was, you know, timed, I think, you know, to really drive in a point, to put it diplomatically. (laughs) Okay. About my son? Well, he he was in the service. He was in the Air Force before he went into the State Department. So... All I had with him was communication was by telephone or every now and then. You know, he would, I would talk to him about every day from wherever he was. And when he was with the State Department, it was places like uh, South Africa or The Hague or Moscow or that kind of thing. 
So I talked to him every day, but I never once really talked to his wife. I never really knew her. He got engaged to her after he went in the service. So I never knew her. I'm sure she's a wonderful person, but I still don't know her. Well, we honor him, and, you know, he's the best that the United States has to offer. And the same is true of Ty Woods. Uh, Charles, tell us about your son. Ty, he wasn't just a statistic. He wasn't just a number. He was my son. And for that reason, Memorial Day, particularly this last year, uh, hit me rather hard. And it's a completely different feeling when you realize um, what it is to be an American hero. And that, quite frankly, he's just one chain in the link of all these American heroes that have been willing to sacrifice their lives on behalf of the country that we love. And Ty, he went into the Navy straight out of high school. He could have uh, wrestled in college if he'd wanted to. And he went in to, quote unquote, not to scrape barnacles off the bottom of his ship, but to be a Navy SEAL. And uh, he did that, uh, broke his uh, <laughs> broke a bone and had to go back and take it a second time. He put in his 20 years as a Navy SEAL, and then he retired. But once you're uh, a, a SEAL, it's always in your blood. And he really loved working with the teams. They could have made him an officer, but he turned that down because he just he liked working with the men. And so they'd call him up to do a job, and he wouldn't tell me where he was going. He'd just say, like in this case, uh, Dad, I can't tell you where I'm going or how long I'm going to be gone, but I have a, say, a business trip to the Middle East. And well, we're, we're running out of time, and I want to bring both of you back because I feel very strongly okay. about this case and every bone in my body. I will do my best to win this for you and to win this for your sons. And we, I, know that, I know that you will. Uh, we will prevail in the end. Uh, I'm right. confident. Even the D.C. Circuit, which also tends to, to lean a little left. I mean, right. they're got, they've got to do the right thing here. So thank you both. God bless you all. Before he was a trial lawyer, he sliced him and diced him. People used to ask me, Larry, what caused you to start Judicial Watch and now Freedom Watch, given the powerful forces in this country that put you at risk? In a meat packing plant. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. A very special prosecutor, Larry Clayman. Be the one who makes our country great again. Go to freedomwatchusa.org and donate. Welcome back. Uh, I have Ben Stein, who's a very good friend of mine. Everybody knows Ben. Uh, a tremendous talent, also a lawyer. I don't know that a lot of people know that. Uh, he was an excellent securities lawyer. But I've gotten to know Ben over the years, and, and I consider him what, as one of my best friends, and I admire him. And I asked him to come on because I'd like him to comment on what's been happening with Kathy Griffin and that uh, attempted uh, incitement of the president to holding up a, a bloody head of, of President Trump. And, of course, Ben, you've been in Hollywood a long time. You understand what goes on out here and in the entertainment industry. What are your thoughts about this? Well, let me break it down, as we say. Uh, Kathy Griffin is not a normal person. This is just my opinion. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a, a doctor. But I've been on TV with her a number of times, and I stopped being on any show where they told me she was going to be there. She's full of hostility. She's extremely angry. I would say she's angry to the point of irrationality. Uh, she's not, at least in my opinion, she's not at all funny. Um, I don't, uh, I don't doubt that to, to some people she is funny. I don't doubt that to some people she has talent. But the showing of a severed head in imitation of an ISIS or Al Qaeda terrorist, showing a severed head of the man that we people, the people of America, elected to be our president under the Constitution, is an incitement to murder. It's an incitement to commit assassination. And I think it should be investigated as such. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that it should be, uh, she should be convicted as such, but I think it should be investigated whether she had ties with Al Qaeda, whether she had ties with ISIS, what, what her uh, motivation for doing such an outrageous thing was. Well, of course, we know that other entertainers, not obviously on our side, the conservative libertarian side, but Madonna, Snoop Dogg, uh, Charlie Sheen, others have made references to the demise of President Trump. Uh, what's your thoughts? Do you think they should be investigated, too? 
Well, Charlie Sheen, I have to say, is a good friend, so I don't want to say anything bad about him. He's a he's a great guy, and he's a great joker, and uh, he's a person who's had very, very serious, very, very, very serious personal problems, and uh, I don't want to go against him. Snoop Dogg, I know uh, very slightly. He and I were uh, on a TV show once. I'm sure he doesn't remember. I'm sure there's much of his life he doesn't remember. He is a self-professed and very enthusiastic enjoyer of recreational drugs. Uh, I think uh, that is not an excuse under the law, as you both know, but uh, I think he should be questioned about whether he has ties to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. And let's back up for a second about the entertainment community. It would have been unthinkable in the heyday of the entertainment community in the 30s, 40s, 50s for this kind of thing to go on. What insanity has infected the entertainment community so-called entertainment community, for it to become the community of uh, thinking that a severed head of the U.S. president is amusing. What 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 craziness has gotten into this beautiful Hollywood? I, I can't understand. I mean, it's a great life. It's an incredibly, unbelievably great life. What are they complaining about? What do they have to be so angry about? It worries me that we have such sick people in such a glorious environment. Well, you're right. I mean, I, I'm out here doing some entertainment work. Actually, my my home is Florida, but I, I spend a lot of time out here, and, and it sickens me because there are people like you in the entertainment community who are really good people, a lot of conservatives. You're, right. you're, you're one of the there few are, that speak lot, up. Everybody's scared. I'm not scared because I've long since been written off. I mean, <laughs> my show won seven Emmys. I have three Emmys on my mantelpiece in my living room, but I couldn't get arrested in this town now. Uh, because uh, people know that I'm a conservative, and that that's got to be such a strict uh, taboo. Uh, it doesn't stop me because I mean I have other means of livelihood. But I, I'm, uh, but it is terrifying. It's become a one-party Stalinist state. Basically, Hollywood is a one-party Stalinist state, and you are not allowed to transgress the the ideal so-called of the Stalinist regime. And the Stalinist regime is set forth in an area roughly roughly from uh, just west of Beverly Hills going out to Malibu. And I see it out there, in particular in Malibu. We have a home in Malibu. When I go to the Malibu, safe Malibu pavilions, I'm terrified to even show my face because somebody's going to start screaming at me about well, Trump. And, and don't wear an American flag because <laughs> when I'm out here and people see that, they say, oh, you must be a Trump supporter. Isn't that a sad commentary? So it's really sad, uh, Ben. Thank you for coming on. Uh, we ran out of time. Love to have you back on in the future, my good friend. And thank you for your courage, because there are very few people in Hollywood who have your courage. And frankly, we need the courage in the rest of the country, too, because we're facing, frankly, a potential political apocalypse right now with what's going on. And I've been talking about that throughout this show. So thanks, Ben. God bless you. <laughs>